Can you all hear me? Thank you. Thank you for sticking it out and being here and uh, joining us. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about cultivating clinical curiosity. I feel like, um, well, it kind of builds upon notions of care that we've heard previously. Uh, the, the idea of clinical medical curiosity is absolutely central to me. Uh, curiosity itself is kind of, it's the spice of life. It's why I do my job. It's what draws people to medicine. And it is curiosity itself that ignites the fire of inquiry. Inquiry that fuels innovation, that begets observations, um, that then uh, provide all the data that help us improve the care of patients. All of that uh, provides the, the backdrop for the cultivation of empathy. And as you all know at Nueva, empathy is the really the first step in the whole design process that leads us to innovation and the betterment of humanity. For me, I feel like clinical curiosity should be the very the biggest component of the medical bag. It should spring out of the metal, medical bag like like a jack in the box. It's, I don't think anyone should have a medical bag without curiosity, which is why I chose this image. Uh, and it's the source of my joy in my medical practice. It's what, what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's what transforms what could be mundane practice. Some people would say, I'm a fa family doctor. Some people might say that patients coming in one after the other with similar complaints could be dull. And it isn't at all. It's absolutely fascinating because of clinical curiosity. So th this is me in my element. Uh, I'm known as the bubble doctor. I love what I do. I see babies and kids, adults. My oldest patient would have been 100 this year. She died recently. I take care of her daughter and her daughter's children. Uh, and every patient that I get to see has some unique story that brings to life uh, the care that we that I provide and that animates um, their stories. So that it's that kind of human element that brings medical medical students to Stanford. This is the first year medical school class. They come to Stanford very much to connect with human beings. They want to translate scientific discovery in the application at the bedside to help people lead healthier lives, to be happier, to live longer, healthier. Uh, and they're full of passion. They're full of um, imagination about how, all the ways that they're going to make the world better through medicine. But there's a problem. And the problem is that in the first couple of years of medical school, we plop them down into biochemistry class, big lecture halls. We make them memorize a lot of information. And we teach them about caring for patients with standardized patients and with mannequins. And while that's important, it's kind of vanilla flavored as it goes for the care of patients. What, we, what they strive for and what I hope to deliver to them is more Rocky Road, Razzmatazz, some better, wider variety of flavors. So uh, it is for that reason that I started a program it, under the umbrella of patient and family engaged medical education, where we bring patients together with students uh, from the very first weeks of medical school. We have 40 students and 40 patients who are paired, and the students experience health illness and the journey of navigating healthcare through the eyes of their patients, the patient's families and caregivers. This, uh, we kind of joke that we have 40 different curricula. It, it's like crazy um, and very, lots of flavors. It's more than Rocky Road. Um, so this um, experience, this program really introduces our students to human drama. And one of the aspects of this program, in one of this uh, one domain of the program, we have a course called Walk With Me that uh, requires the students and patient partners to develop projects by the end of the, the course. It's very much like Quest. Uh, so I'm going to just give you a couple of examples of Quest projects. This is 
my student Bright, who was whose patient partner Jody, who has a YouTube site. Um, she's a small person. She I think she's maybe three foot ten, and she loves to cook as does Bright. So they developed a video um, that instructs people about how to make chocolate chip cookies in Jody's retrofitted, very low. Um, totally adapted kitchen. So you can imagine Bright learned a lot about Jody's perspective on health uh, and navigating the world. This uh, patient Patri uh, student, Patricia, and her patient uh, explored her patient's experience of having lung disease as being what you'll see is a visual representation of a first card of kind of the representation of the lungs is the hospital gown and behind the hospital gown gown is an x-ray and then layers of depth of what uh, of how he experiences the world what's important to him his beliefs and values that they explored together maite the student in the middle went to every one of her little baby patients well child visits and experienced what that's like um, virtually, to how to, what it's like to be a new parent. And Sandrine uh, navigated the complex world of chemotherapy and uh, cancer treatment with her patient. They, uh, they met every month for pancakes at the pancake, at whatever, slack, uh, stacks. Um, so through this course, what we're really endeavoring to do is to inspire our students to be the doctor depicted in this uh, 1891 uh, painting. The doctor who's fully focused on his patient, who's observing, not just seeing, who's appreciating in a mindful, slow, connected way, appreciating the patient and her surround, um, and devoting what looks like a long night, because it looks as though the sun is just coming up, uh, to caring for his patient. This, well, um, my environment isn't quite so picturesque. This is my clinic environment, the hallway of my clinic environment, but I want to give you an idea of what kind of deep clinical observation looks like to me in a pedestrian way. Um, this, so this is the hallway outside a clinic room, and I haven't seen my patients yet. I don't even know who the patient is. Um, but already I'm kind of establishing, I'm observing to figure out who I'm going to be seeing. So I want you just to notice that there's a green apple. I don't know if you can see that little poke of green. And you probably can't tell, but those are seaweed snacks. Really great food for somebody who belongs in a stroller. What might life look like for this family if these were the snacks that they had, which is really much more common in my world. I see kids coming for their 8 a.m. appointments with those giant lollipops, you know, that are like 8 million calories and all sugar. And so instead of that, I'm already seeing this family cares about their health. And I get a glimpse of them, a little more of a glimpse. And I, I want to kind of, um, I hope, inspire you to slow down in your interactions. So as a physician, I could l try to leap through, you know, make my way to the, the inevitable computer in the back and just start talking to them, eliciting a history. But I really like to enjoy the first few moments of a clinical encounter and kind of take it in. So I'm taking in this adorable family, mother comes in with her four children. So I, the, for, I know many of you are not parents, but this is like a remarkable little tableau. The kids' hair is cut. All of them have pretty good haircuts, which means they don't have ADHD. She's somehow able to navigate that. She probably cuts their hair herself. They all have clothes that sort of go together. Um, and importantly, for as a clinician, as I'm looking, as I'm just kind of taking it in, I'm trying to decide which of the four kids come, goes first. This is going to be a two-hour visit. Who do I talk to first? And I would say, I'm going to, well, who would you choose? Who do you think, who's the kind of power broker? Who holds the power in this relationship? Tyler. The boy in the back was pretty mischievous. <laughs> he, that one? No, I 
this. So yeah, so he he holds the power. So he's literally the apex of the the image um, in the photograph. But he also so mom is looking to him. The little the mischief the real mischievous one, the little guy, uh, is connected with him. He literally has his hand there, right? And this guy is the one I worry about, actually. <laughs> He's he's got his hands on the little twirly things on the twirly stool. He's you know so in a family four he's actually literally in a medical sense I'm a little bit worried about his safety because he's the one who's going to go off and you know try to blow something up. But so if I start with the power broker in this encount in this visit, I'm likely to get more buy-in because the others are going to follow suit. Just by way of example. So in a clinical encounter, I'm really excited to observe things closely like hands, feet, and accoutrement. Hands really do tell a story. Do you know who this is? Nadal. Nadal, yeah. Is he right or left-handed? Left-handed, totally. Big left arm, right? Both arms are big. Hands tell an incredible story. Uh, they can tell us if someone works in the field or works on a computer. They tell us if someone smokes. They tell us what people do. So if you can see, oh, I there are lines on this man's arms, especially the right arm. He's a baker. There's, there are lines that are more obvious. Those lines uh, come from the tortures of working in a, in a um, bakery where he's lifting up pans and burning. Right, that's, so that's very common. If you really study people's arms, um, you will see that for people who cook frequently. These people all have something in common that they, um, they've been exposed to something uh, that's caused this reaction on their skin. They have nickel allergies. This woman has um, one leg that's smaller than the other, that's weaker. If you just looked at her shoes, you could tell that because she's, her, her right shoe has been dragging across the ground because her right leg is weaker. Patients sometimes come into clinic in slippers and you think, ah, maybe they just like rushed out of the house. But maybe they came in slippers because they couldn't fit their shoes on their feet and maybe their feet really hurt Maybe they have bunions that need to be corrected. I love this story of a 69-year-old truck driver who, um, who has sun damage on the left side of his face. So uh, he has dermatoheliosis. We like big words. Uh, which is uh, a result of sunlight going through the, through the glass, UVA, and causing solar damage by... Um, destroying the fibrous kind of connective tissue in his skin. So he provides his own control for what happens if you don't wear sunblock. You should wear sun. The, the message is sunblock and hats are important. Skin is important, but so are clothes. So what does it tell you that we put gowns on our patients? To me, um, seeing a patient in a gown kind of strips them of so much of their identity and so much of what makes them, uh, well, reflects how they choose to show up in the world. So I like to see my patients in their clothes. This woman took some time choosing out that sweatshirt. And she somehow, she has a history of arthritis, but somehow she was able to put that fiddly little charm bracelet on her hand. So either she has a very loving partner or her arthritis is doing really well. Uh, regardless, she's having a good day. And speaking of sweatshirts, this patient is a 65-year-old man who has high blood pressure and diabetes and a history of smoking. And he was in for a physical exam. And his doctor said, so, you know, is anything bothering you? No, I feel fine. I'm, you know, just the huge. I'm, I'm good. Um, and the doctor's like, well, what's that smudgy thing on, on your sweatshirt? And there was an area that had kind of denuded the fabric. It, it was all worn down on his chest. And he said, oh, yeah, when I walk, I get this pain in my chest. And I have to rub it in order to feel better. So he was sent for an angiogram that showed a 99% 
occlusion of the main artery that serves his heart. So his sweatshirt saved his life, really. I, I, want, to, I want to tell you um, about someone I really admire who is now at UC, UC Davis, um, but was at UCSF. Her name is Faith Fitzgerald. She's a physician who's determined to elicit stories from her patients. And she was working with some residents who were slogging through their day. They had 30 patients to see on the wards and they, they were presenting patient after patient kind of in this humdrum way and said, and this patient was the next one. They said, yeah, she's boring. She's just here for pneumonia, 65 or 75 year old woman with pneumonia. And uh, she said, no, there's, there's got to be something, something interesting about her. Uh, about this patient. So she goes into the room and sure enough, it's really, she's had, she has had almost no medical problems. Um, but she did mention that she'd broken her arm way back. So um, Dr. Fitzgerald said, so, you know, what happened? And, and the patient said, well, the, I broke my arm when a trunk fell on my arm. Okay, so tell me more about that. Well, when the boat lurched, the, the steamer trunk fell onto my arm. When the boat lurched, really what, what happened? It, well, it hit an iceberg. And the steamer trunk fell on my arm and broke my arm. So she was a survivor of the Titanic. Like, she was not a boring person. She then became a you know, media celebrity. Um, I want to remind you that everybody has stories and people have clinical clues that might be an entree into those stories. Sometimes they don't and you just have to settle in and ask some generous questions. Expect a story. Your futures are rich and varied and I encourage you to consider the enjoying the diversity of people and, their, and stories around you. Keep human beings at the at the center, especially as tech, the biomedical revolutions of information and tech and AI are upon us, we need to attend to the counterbalance of story and humanism. Thank you so much.